So in this video, I want to talk about the second big group of beta-lactam antibiotics, which are the cephalosporins. So the cephalosporins act identically with the other beta-lactam antibiotics like the penicillins that are discussed in another video. And they just inhibit this enzyme, the transpeptidase, which is responsible for the cross-linking of the cell wall. In terms of adverse effects, they are also very similar to the penicillins. You see a lot of hypersensitivity reactions, which can range from a simple rash to an anaphylactic shock. It's always very important to ask your patient what he or she really experienced to make some adjustment to the antibiotic treatment. And then obviously GI distress that we see with all the antibiotics. So in terms of the spectrum of activity, we also can group the cephalosporins based on their generation to have an idea what they really cover. But generally, you can say they are pretty good against gram-positives, including staph and strap. Gram-negatives I will discuss in the second slides. And then in terms of the anaerobes, there are two cephalosporins from the second generation that have quite a moderate activity, which is xaphoxetan and xaphotetan. So here I have listed all the generations of the cephalosporins. So I started with first, second, and then third and fourth generation. And cephalosporins all start with ceph, and they're a, quite a challenge in terms of the names. So as an example for first generation, I've listed here cephasolin and cephalaxin. So if you are lucky, most of the first generations have after the ceph an A, but it, there's always exceptions, but at least you're going to get most of them. Examples of second generation cephalosporins are cephaloxin, cefuxitin, cefotitan. One way to remember at least those three guys is um, a furry fox is having tea with you. So furoxin, foxetine, and titan. And then we have the third generation examples are ceftriaxone, cefotaxim, and ceftazidim. You can remember those just with tricks, tax, tas, tricks, tax, tas for the third generations. And then we have cefepim, which is a fourth generation. However, it's very similar in terms of its coverage to ceftazidim. So I will also discuss third and fourth kind of together. So I put this cephalosporins now at the same sheet with the penicillins so that you can see some similarities. So remember, the penicillins have overall, over the generations, quite a good gram-positive coverage, but the gram-negative coverage really starts with the third generation, and then it's always going to increase. Here in the cephalosporins, we already have some gram-negative activity, even with the first generation. So we just start earlier to get gram-negative coverage. And overall, they are also very good against gram-positives. So we find here some similarities between the third generation uh, penicillins and the first generation cephalosporins, as long as you don't give this penicillins with the beta-lactamase inhibitor. So what do these first generation cover in terms of gram-negatives? These are the PACs in contrast to HEP, which you have for the penicillins, PAC standing for Proteus mirabilis, Escherichia coli, and Klebsiella. The second generation cephalosporin is very similar, almost identical, with the third generation penicillins if you give them together with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Again, you're gonna cover Henpeg for the gram negatives, Haemophilus influenzae, Neisseria species, Proteus mirabilis, Escherichia coli, and Klebsiella. And then the third, fourth generations are very similar to the fourth generation penicillins in terms of their coverage of Henpeg and the capes. So remember, Henpegs, which I said, and the capes are Citrobacter, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas enterobacter, and Serratia. So the only difference is that Pseudomonas is not covered with all of the third, fourth generation very well. So it's really only well covered with cefepin and ceftazidin. And as I have mentioned in the beginning, they, have, they are very similar in terms of the spectrum of activity. And these are the ones that really get the pseudomonas on board. So I just want to finish up with some specials about the cephalosporins. So as they are generally pretty broad spectrum antibiotics, it's definitely helpful to have some bacteria in mind that they do not cover. And they can be remembered with LAME, which stands for Listeria, Atypicals, Mycoplasma, and Enterococci. So 
Cephalosporins do not cover listeria in contrast to penicillins, particularly the third generation that do so very well. For some reason, cephalosporins do not recognize the penicillin binding proteins of listeria. Then they do not cover the atypicals, meaning the causative agents of atypical pneumonia, which is Legionella pneumophilia, Mycoplasma pneumonia, and Chlamydophilia pneumonia. And this is also predictable because none of these bacteria has this typical cell wall. They are all slightly different or do not even have a cell wall like Mycoplasma. And so Mycoplasma is double covered in LAME because it also stands for the M. And then we have also Enterococci, which are intrinsically resistant against cephalosporins. So the only other thing I want to mention is a so-called advanced generation cephalosporin, which is ceftarolin. Sometimes it's referred also as fifth generation, but most of the people just say advanced generation because it actually does not make sense to call it a fifth generation. Because normally when we talk about these generations, we always increase the spectrum of activity and add on bacteria. But this is not true for ceftarolin. It's actually pretty different. First of all, it's the only beta-lactam antibiotic that covers MRSA, which is discovered in another video, and it does not have any pseudomonas coverage, which is also in contrast to ceftazidin, cefepim, third, fourth generation, which do have pseudomonas coverage. This concludes the video on the cephalosporins.